invite you to stand as we worship our King together this morning, singing songs of praise of His name.
Bible Church, it is so good to gather with you together this morning. And as we gather, we have a reason to celebrate because somebody has ex- has decided to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So would you turn your attention to the screen as we celebrate that? Well, good morning. Today is an exciting day at Christ Church. My name is Peter Buckland. I'm one of the elders here, and today is Child Dedication Sunday. So if you are here to dedicate your child um, to the Lord, if you would come up on stage right behind me while I give a couple of announcements this morning, um, that would really help us out. And just don't be afraid. Just come up right behind me in here. We have about seven or so um, families that have signed up this morning. We have a total of 41 altogether. And if you did not sign up, you're still welcome to come on up. So come on up. And if you are here and you are the official uh, photographer and you need a better spot to take a picture, come on up also. And you're welcome to do that. We're going to do a meet and greet at the end of this. So there'll be plenty of time to go back and sit down. Um, I'd like to welcome you this morning to our worship services, and if you are a guest with us, have not been here before, I'd like to invite you to stop by at the Welcome Center on our way, on your way out, and just get a little bit introduced to the church, and we have a little gift for you that we'd like to give to you to say thank you for worshiping with us today. Advent and Christmas are right around the corner. Can you believe it? Uh, We're just barely into feeling like fall, and Christmas is going to be coming. And Advent begins on December the 1st, and for four consecutive Sunday nights, we'll be worshiping here at the church at 5 o'clock. And we'll be remembering the first time Jesus came and looking forward to his second coming. So uh, would you join us for this particular tradition uh, with our church starting on December the 1st? And also along with that, sometimes the holidays are a little bit difficult for us because of grief and loss. And we have a special event called Surviving the Holidays on November the 17th that if you have... Um, are feeling grief and loss this year and would like to have some help to process that and work through how you want to handle this year's holiday season, this is an event just for you. And uh, there will be childcare for uh, birth through pre-K. And if you would get a hold of our counseling center or talk to Cindy Cutler, or send an email to her, you can get signed up for that. And we would be happy to help you to see how you could celebrate the holidays the very best way that you possibly can. So why don't you all step up here just a little bit into the light a little bit. I'm going to stand over here so they can get a great picture. And I'm not in the way with my semi-bald head. So Uh, welcome this morning to uh, present your children to the Lord. Um, You know, God has given you as parents the most amazing responsibility to invest in your children to um, help them to know who he is and to be able to serve him well. As you think about who God is and how you want to live that out, he has given us the opportunity to really um, present Christ to them in everything that we do. Um, God is not afraid of the culture, even though we might be, and because of the power of his spirit and the way in which he wants to work in your life, Um, He will empower you to be able to manage your family really, really well. In fact, he's given us some priorities that he would like for you to remember. And this morning, I want to remind you of the very first time that God gave some directions to parents in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to take you there um, in your holy imagination, if you will, that the nation of Israel was ready to cross the Jordan And when they were going to cross the Jordan into a brand new land that God was going to give them, he told parents that the commands, the decrees, and the laws that he is giving them are to help them to grow their children so that they would get to know God in this new land, so that they would be attached to him. And then he said that this would be the way that they would know that they could live a full and long-lasting life. And then there is the most familiar passage of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these commands are to be written on your hearts. You are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the way, when you lie down, and when you stand up. 
And what God is saying is that you as moms and dads have the most power to raise children to know God. The attachment that they make to God and your own modeling really does matter. And so what God is saying is that he wants for you to take advantage of all of the moments, not just the formal moments of sitting down with your kids, but those informal moments as well. And it is our hope that we can encourage you to do that, not only on your own time, but also here at the church. It is our pledge to you that we would provide for you a safe, spiritual, guiding environment, not only for you, but for your children, so that all together we partner so that your children and you would really be able to walk a life of faith, because we want to do that, a life of love. God gets uh, the opportunity to create these environments of life, and you as parents um, really get to control that in so many ways. So this morning, as you stand here, it is our commitment that we will stand with you as a congregation, individually and corporately, to help you to parent your children and for you to be as healthy as you possibly can be as well. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing for you. Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have. We thank you that we can commit ourselves to you and we pray right now that you would bless these children to really be able to know you that you would help these parents to teach you and to model you and to show what real life is like uh, that you have designed for us to have. And we pray, Lord, that you will move, move us forward so that we would, in faith, be able to have the kind of family life that you would want for us to have. And where that gets hard, we ask that you would bless us as a community of faith to join with each other to help move forward through whatever difficulty lies ahead. Bless us. Guide us, direct us, and allow for us to thrive. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would head on out back to the, on your stage right over there to uh, Tammy. She has a little gift for you. And for the rest of you, if you'd get up and greet those that are around you, um, we'll continue with our singing and worship in just a little bit. Good. 
God's goodness does run after us, and he is the author of all things that are good. We have come to the point in our gathering where we find ourselves every Sunday, where we are going to remember the sacrifice of Jesus and the goodness of God within that sacrifice. Mark's sermon today is entitled, Truth Matters. And that's really what I want for you to think about devotionally today is how truth matters in this moment. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that he died, he was buried, and he's raised, and that his sacrifice paid the price of our sin, that we might have a relationship with God restored to what he had originally intended it to be. And in this moment right now, the truth of that can explode in our hearts with gratitude and thankfulness and peace with God. Jesus told us to, rem to remember this moment. He said in Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So why did Jesus say that we are to remember him and remember these truths? Well, memory connects us with the past and the present. In fact, it helps us with our foundation about who we are and who we want to be and how we behave today and remembering the sacrifice of Christ, remembering the truths that the gospel is centered on, remembering the truth of who God is, both in our past, God is chasing after us in his goodness, and in the future, that he is waiting for us no matter what happens, allows for us to be the kind of people that God wants for us to be. As I was thinking about this this morning, I thought about what if we do feel a little bit lonely about this, and I checked some of the stats about how many Christians there are in the world. Today, there are roughly 2.38 billion Christians. And throughout the year, no matter what their tradition is, they all come to this place to remember Jesus, the truth of who he is. And we join our brothers and sisters, all 2.38 billion of them, in this moment to remember. The gospel matters because it changes our lives gospel matters because it grounds us. The gospel matters because it gives us a future. So today, what is the truth that you want to really focus in on in this moment that you can have your own private moment as well as corporately? We proclaim who Jesus is by this act. If you're a guest today, the cups are double stacked with the emblems, with the the bread on the bottom and the juice on the top. Separate those as you participate today. And if you are not a Christian, let them go by and consider who this amazing person, Jesus Christ is, that you might consider how you would want to interact with him. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for this moment, this moment of truth, because truth matters. This moment where we can proclaim who Jesus is and who we believe that he is. This moment of gospel hope. This moment of remembrance. And so we ask, Lord, that you would meet us in this moment exactly how we need you. Whether that's to sit quietly, whether that's to celebrate something, whether that's to come back to you and ask you to work in our lives. You work in this moment in order to keep us close to you and to remember that we are grounded on the truth of who you are, what you have done in our lives, and what you will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello and welcome. I'm Martin Russo, and I serve on the pastoral care team. Thank you for joining us in preaching God's word. Whether you're checking us out for the first time or coming back for our online weekly gathering, we hope you have an experience with Jesus that makes you long for more. The truth is, our lives were made for him, and we believe that we can experience the fullness of the life that he offers by participating in the life of the church, which isn't a building to occupy or a screen to observe, but a community of people who call Jesus king. 
We would love to invite you to our in-person gatherings on Thursdays at 6.30 and Sundays at 8, 9.15, and 10.45. We know that not everyone's circumstances allow them to be present in our gatherings, but we believe that experiencing Jesus can't be complete if it's only contained in an hour of an online service. And we want more than that for you. We want you to join a community of Jesus followers to hear the word of God, participate in the Lord's table, and find encouragement as many worship him but also to give, that you'd be a blessing by singing, listening, serving, and being an encouragement to others who need your life and your testimony to remind them of the greatness of our God and the goodness of his mercy. If you have more questions about Christ Church, we're here for you. If we can pray for you in any way, please contact us at cco.church prayer. We'd love to connect and experience completeness in Jesus together. If our hosts who are collecting the offering would like to go ahead and get started with that, please do. Christ Church is a generous church, and we've come to another important time in our service, and that's collecting our tithes and our gifts and our offerings. You see, as a church, we have pooled our time, our talents, and our treasures to make a difference in this community and around the world. But this generosity is based on the generosity of God himself. We've just celebrated and remembered what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And Paul reminds us that this is the most generous action that God has taken. And because of this generous action, we can expect that he will continue to work in our lives in generous ways. He talks about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Paul wrote this, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with giving us a Jesus, graciously give us all things? All of the promises of God, his promise to walk with us, his promise to care for us, and his promise for our future with him are all wrapped up within what we have just remembered in Jesus, because truth matters. If you are new to Christ Church, and this is your new church home, you are entering a fellowship of generosity. We are serious about serving God, and we want people to hear the good news about who Jesus is and see the results of God's work within their lives. And so, as a collective group of people, we celebrate the generosity of God, and we commit ourselves to being generous ourselves that no matter where we go, we recognize that because of the greatness of God in our lives, we also are able to make an impact with other people. So this morning, let's ask the Lord's blessing to be more like him, and in so doing, even be generous as much as we can be in all areas of our lives. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this reminder that we have every Sunday about how amazing you are. You are simply the most amazing person in the whole universe. And you create amazing experiences in our lives. And one of those is to be generous. We tend to be tight-fisted and you want us to be open-handed. You tend to make us focused in on what's important to us, but you tell us what's important to you and then bless us that you would help for us to be like you. So this morning, we present ourselves to you again and we ask that you would continue to foster us and grow us, to make us generous, that not only in our personal lives, but in the church's life, we would be known as a generous people. In Jesus' name, amen. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. 
Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy 4, 1-8 Well, good morning, church. Wow, that was loud. Hey, if you keep your Bibles open to 2 Timothy chapter 4, we're going to be looking at those first eight verses. Uh, and if you've missed the series or you've been in and out over the past uh, eight, nine weeks, I want to kind of bring you all together in a summary as quickly as possible. Paul has been in prison for the second time, and he's pretty certain we're going to find out in the text today that he doesn't have long that he's not going to be released, that Rome is going to use him as an example. Instead of whining and complaining and begging to be free, Paul is actually settling in and encouraging us through this letter to Timothy about how we're to live our life. Let's never forget the tone by which Paul speaks because he is facing the end of his life and he's leaving a message for us to hold on to. This whole series has focused, and what I'm learning in 2 Timothy is that Paul is challenging us how to remain actively faithful to Jesus and how to invite others into that life. It's not just to protect yourself and survive, it's actually advance the kingdom. Yes, this is a letter written to a particular man in a particular town, in a particular church. We can't deny that. We have to interpret the Bible to who it was written. But there's great implications for all of us as well. We might as well be named Timothy. Even though we may not be pastoring a church, we have opportunities to live out exactly what Paul is calling us to live out. So I want to review from last week, chapter 3, verses 14 and 17. If you have your Bibles open, you can see it right there. We're challenged about the power of the Word of God. It tells us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. It guides us and it leads us. God gave it to us deliberately so that we could know truth, so that we could have wisdom, so we could have hope, and most of all, so we could know him. The word is not just available to some occasionally, but it's actually the guiding light. And because of what we learned last week in those verses, I just want to open this morning by saying this, because of that truth, we have something to say. It's the most important thing for you and I to understand why Paul's telling Timothy this. He's telling this preacher, you have something to say, so what's the expectation? Say it. You do have something to say. It does matter. In chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, we'll look at here in just a moment, he's telling us that a high view of Scripture has relevancy. Not only does it have relevancy to our development, It has relevancy to the world in which we live. We're not just sent here to be protected from all that's going to happen to them. You and I have been called to be ambassadors, representatives of God's kingdom, inviting anyone who will listen to come be a part of it. So because we have something to say, these words matter. These words that we've been given matter for more than just ourselves. They matter for everyone we know. Let's read verses 1 and 2. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. This charge. Preach. Well, let's change that word because when you and I think of the word preach, we think of what I'm doing right now. But that's not, the the word means to proclaim. 
<clears throat> the word preach and proclaim are the same word. It's what a herald would do when sent out by the king. The king would announce, I'm coming to your town in two weeks, prepare for me. This is what the herald would do. He would show up and say, the king is coming, prepare for the king's arrival, and the people would respond. And we have been told to proclaim. Interesting. Don't picture a church service. Picture an everyday interaction. Living your life in such a way that it matters. It describes what we do when we share good news of any form with anyone. We are proclaiming, this is going to happen. This has happened. Prepare yourself. In fact, there's even a, a picture of proclamation in, in the Gospels. It's found in Mark chapter 1, verse 45. Jesus heals a leprous man, and it says, And that man went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. Did he preach a sermon? No. Was he dissecting the book of Isaiah? No. He was actually telling people what Jesus had done and telling them that he could do it for them too. This is the word. These words matter. And he says the charge is for all of us to find a way each and every day to proclaim the good news, to proclaim what God has done and what he can do for them. But what is the impetus behind it? Why are we to proclaim the good news? Because it's our duty? Because it's our obligation? Because God will be miffed at us if we don't? No. Paul actually says that the impetus for us proclaiming the gospel is the day of judgment. Uh-oh. Christians don't want to hear about that in America. We don't want to hear that there is an accountability, there is a responsibility, and that God is expecting a response from us for what he's done for us. It's not our duty. It's a natural reaction for us to be grateful when we've been blessed. And so Paul says it's a day of judgment. There is a day for every single person who's ever lived on God's earth that we will be judged for whether we stood for the truth or not. Christians will be judged. And unbelievers will be judged. If I can put it more simply, every person will stand before God as a sinner. Some will kneel before their Savior and some will kneel before their judge. And the beauty of God's kingdom is you get to choose who you kneel before. The one who saved you from your sin and judgment? Or will you stand before a judge and offer your best reasoning, your best alibi, your best excuse for why you should not be punished by that judge? And this is why Paul says we need to proclaim the good news of Jesus because people who are unaware will, will kneel before a judge rather than kneeling in honor before their Savior. I know this is a strange transition, but I saw a meme about, I think I looked it up about four months ago. I saved it to my photos. The funny ones I'll share with my friends when they've forgotten I've already shared them. You know, it's that kind of thing I do. And it's, it's interesting we live in a day where memes are probably some of the most, uh, they're probably the proverbs of our day, to be honest with you. But I got this meme, and it, it made me nostalgic. It made me very, very sentimental. And it simply said this, at some point in your childhood, you and your friends went outside to play together for the last time, and you had no idea. And I was like, aw. My buddies and I, after we'd, we'd play home run derby or wiffle ball all the time. And we would just call each other, 3.30, my yard, and everyone would show up. And one time we did that, and we had no idea. It'd be the last time all of us would ride our bikes together, show up in someone's yard, and play wiffle ball. Now, I know some of you are like, so? Well, give me a moment. Here's what I want you to understand. The judgment of Jesus is coming. We don't know when it's going to come. And one day we will live a normal life, and then it will happen. And no one will have any idea this was the last day we went about our day, our way. Does that make sense? This is what Paul wants you and I to understand when he says that we need to be proclaiming that Jesus is available because we assume we have plenty of what? Time, and we don't know that we do. This is the impetus behind Paul's charge to Timothy. I mean, just look at the verse. It won't appear on the screen, but he says, he's gonna judge the living and the dead. He's going to appear and he will bring his kingdom. And I wanna kneel before my savior. And I don't want anybody to have to kneel before the judge because the judge will only do the right thing. And the right thing will be to bring punishment on those who have rebelled against his authority. You see, 
it, it goes without saying, but this is what we preachers do. I'm going to say it again. These words matter. You see, because of all of this, Paul is telling us that we are a people shaped by the first coming of Jesus and reshaped by the second coming of Jesus. This is not an option to consider for one day. We each have people in our lives in the intersections of our everyday existence. You and I have people who do not know that one day they will stand before the living God and give an account. And instead of frightening them with that, we get to offer them hope, love, and grace. See, we have something to say and these words are always appropriate. That's what I learned from Paul's teaching. That these words he's given us, this message of the goodness of Christ and the love of God, these words are always appropriate. Verse 2, be prepared in season and out of season. There's an urgency stressed here. I know this is what you'd expect to hear in church. We're talking about matters of life, death, and eternity. If you don't believe that Jesus found his return important, look at how many parables Jesus told us where a king or an owner or a father went on a trip and left responsibilities with those under his care and he came back and what did he expect? He expected an accountability. The parables are replete with this. So Jesus took this seriously and we will too because we are a people shaped by his coming and his return and there is an urgency to this. We are a people who will take the opportunities we're given. We won't worry about whether or not it's perfect. If you wait for the perfect moment to tell someone about Christ's return, that day is going to come and you're gonna find yourself you weren't ready. To stand before God and say, I offered Jesus, the Jesus that loved me and saved me and forgave me, I offered that to anybody I knew. I, I offered it whether they listened or didn't listen. I didn't worry about the condition of the soil of their heart. I'm the sower who threw the seed. But I want to back up for just a second. And I want to put your hearts at ease. Remember, I told you, you're not to preach a three-point sermon that begins with the letter Q, okay? Sharing is when someone is troubled, sharing the hope of the gospel. When someone is hurting, sharing the hope of the gospel. When someone has joy in their life, sharing the hope of the gospel. In season and out of season. Whether you're considered cool or uncool. Whether you're considered wise or foolish. We know these words matter and we know they're always going to be appropriate. The gospel never goes out without return. This is what we're encouraged to do. So these words matter. These words are always important, and we have something to say because these words are effective. Again, verse 2. They correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. These aren't hateful words. I I want you to stop and and not be scared of talking about the goodness of God. We think, well, they'll roll their eyes or they'll think we're some some crazy fanatic. Let them think what they want to think. If what you have is truth, offer them truth. These are not hateful words that belittle or demean people. The gospel isn't flowery spiritual words that are absent of everyday living. They fit in the context that every one of us face. These words don't segregate the elite from the common. They fit every soul's need. And these words bring life. Paul says to Timothy, but do it with patience. Remember, this is not about the art of our persuasion. It's not about getting what we want from them. We offer the words of the gospel because we know how they work. How do we know? Because they've worked in us. They've brought change and they've brought life and they've brought peace. See, we are a people who believe in the truth of Jesus and are willing to share it for the sake of people's salvation and eternity. We will take the risk. These words matter. These words are appropriate. These words are effective. And we have something to say because these words will reveal the desire of mankind's heart. They reveal the desire of each of our hearts. Verses three and four. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. This is sad for me because I do believe that gospel works and I do believe they're effective and I do believe they're appropriate and I do believe they matter. 
But I also know that with free will, people can harden their hearts to the truth. This is why you and I don't have the responsibility of sealing the deal, of making the sale. We cast the seed. We offer the hope. And some people can harden their hearts from it. You, you can think about it. It's not always for lack of understanding. See, the worst thing that can happen in my life is to have someone I love not understand what's available to them. What they do with what's available to them is between them and the Lord. You even know in John chapter 6, Jesus preaches a pretty dramatic statement. Thousands of people gathered around him. And when he was done with this sermon, only 12 remained. That's not a good sermon, I'd guess. But Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot be a part of my kingdom. And they walked away sad. And some of those who walked away were his disciples. They had heard him preach. They had seen his miracles. They knew who he was. And they walked away because the expectation on their heart was too much. They didn't want to divide anymore. They, they, they wanted to live the lives they wanted to live. They did not want to trust him in this. And in that moment, they chose what to do with the gospel. And it will reveal the hearts. Because we live in a world where you can find teachers that tell you what you want to hear. You can find churches that will tell you that you're supposed to be rich and, and happy and successful in all things. And if you're not, it's your fault. You just don't have enough faith in God. You can find teachers that will tell you that sexual ethics don't matter anymore. That it's not a big deal, that we're a prudish nation and we just need to get over it and move on. Yet they never ever want to talk to the counselors that will tell you the destruction of sexual immorality in families and in people's hearts and souls. So we can find people to tell us what we want to hear or we can trust that these words matter and we have something to say. A buddy of mine, Luke Proctor, preaches in Indianapolis and he shared with me some research he came across there's a scholar in the United Kingdom named Theo Hobson. And Hobson said there are three indicators that a society has undergone a complete moral revolution. Think about that. Three factors of a society that's undergone a complete moral revolution. See if these don't sound familiar. What was universally condemned is now celebrated. What was celebrated is now condemned. Those who refuse to celebrate are now condemned. I don't know about you, but that sounds like today, doesn't it? Now, I'm not a guy, I hope you know this, I'm not a guy who just trashes culture and feels superior. What I'm trying to tell you is what Paul told Timothy, we need to pay serious attention to. The words of Jesus need to be heard. Whether we're rejected or stonewalled, ignored or accepted, we need to offer light into the darkness because we're living in a moral revolution and it doesn't seem like we're winning, does it? You see, our culture continues to display this tendency to reject God and we need to be a people that believe in the message of hope of the gospel enough to take the risk of being ones who tell it no matter what that costs. So if the truth of the gospel matters, the second point I want to make this morning from Timothy's lessons, the last four verses are, we have work to finish. For some of us, it's work to start. We need to begin to consider how we're going to offer people the goodness of God that we've received. So it's a work God does in us and it's a work that God does through us. Paul gives us two admonitions, two encouragement, two big coaching moments as his life begins to come to its conclusion. The first is keep your head. That's the first principle. Keep your head. Related to the return of Jesus, do not trade the eternal for the temporary. Don't get so caught up in today that you're not considering where today is leading. But don't get so caught up in tomorrow that you miss the opportunities of today. Keep your head. I like what Alistair Begg, he's a Scottish preacher who preaches in Cleveland. Uh, I loved his si simplicity of this. He said, what it means to keep your head is it means don't be fat-headed. Don't be proud. Or he says, don't be bobble-headed. Don't be looking all over the place for something new. And don't be air-headed, wasting your time on worthless things that bring no value. I think that's a good way to keep your head. Don't be a fathead, an airhead, or a bobblehead, okay? Can we all remember those? Good. 
See, we can lose our heads when we get discouraged. We can lose our heads when we offer someone the gospel and they tell us, nah, no thanks. That's a loser thing. Paul says, don't lose your head, keep your head. How do you do that? Endure hardship. This is how we keep our head, endure hardship. Listen, we've learned it this entire, it resounds through entire, Paul's entire First and Second Timothy letters. Suffering is going to come to those who choose the gospel over the world. The godly will always pay a price for the privilege of ministering the word of truth. It will cost us something. But listen to what Paul says in Romans 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. We know this works. We know this matters. And I don't think this is Paul in prison saying to Timothy, I don't know, man, just hang on the best you can, and maybe it's going to be hard, but I think it'll be okay. No, this is Paul. This is this man who has been through it all, and he says to Timothy, I'd do it again. I'd spend my life just the way I did. Once I found Jesus, I wouldn't change a thing. This is the athlete he talked about who has tasted hard-earned victory. This is the soldier who stayed in the fight and did not worry about all the nonsense around him because the enemy was in front, his life was on the line, and he stayed the course. This is the farmer who has calloused hands and sun-scarred skin who is sitting at the table enjoying the produce of his hard work. Endure the hardship. That's how you keep your head. Fulfill your calling. You want to keep your focus? Remember what we've been called to do. We strive to be a people that offers the goodness of Jesus to everyone we meet. We offer them life and hope, but this doesn't happen accidentally. Important choices we make every day with the lives we live. Important choices we make with the opportunities we're willing to take. Important choices we make with the allegiances we choose this day to live fully into to offer the good news of Jesus, or to be silent with them when the opportunities come, to fulfill the calling. So the truth of the gospel matters. And because of that, we're to keep our heads and we're to keep the faith. I think what Paul does here, this might be my favorite part of this letter. I wouldn't have said that two months ago, but having studied and spent a lot of time over the last two months in this letter, I think this last few verses here, Verses 6, 7, and 8 mean more to me than they've ever met before. Let me explain why. What does it mean to keep the faith? Paul does this brilliant thing here. He talks about his past, present, and future. And as he does, I want us to hear it and ask yourself the similar thing. When he says to Timothy, let's begin with the present. In verse 6, Paul says to Timothy these words. This is why I don't think he's a begrudging old man who wishes things had gone different. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure is near. Paul knows he's not getting out of prison and he knows he's going to die. And some of his imagery in some of the books I've been reading and studying for this passage, some of the imagery fascinates me. Paul knew as a Roman soldier, they would not crucify him. You could not crucify a Roman soldier or a Roman citizen, I'm sorry. And so he knows he's not going to die the way Jesus dies, but he knows what Nero is doing, and he probably believes, and this is what history would tell us, not biblical history, but world history, is that Paul was beheaded by Rome. When he uses this image of being poured out like a drink offering, blood would be poured at the base of the altar when a lamb was offered, an innocent lamb was offered for the sins of the people. And Paul knew he'd be beheaded and probably, I hope it's not too graphic, that his blood would be splattered all over the altar on which he would die for the sake of the kingdom. And just about five or six years previously, he wrote a letter to the Philippians we studied this summer. And in that letter, he says that he is imagining the analogy of being poured out, his life being poured out as an offering to God. And now he comes back in this letter and he says to Timothy, it has begun. This is present tense. I am being poured out. Paul knows his life is coming to an end. He looks at his present. Then he looks to his past. Look at verse seven. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul looks back on his life and I wonder... If we would like it said of us that no matter how Mark's life went 
his life was poured out as an offering to God. Wouldn't we love to have that said about us? No matter what that cost is, at the end of it, we look back on our life and Paul says, no, listen, he's not boasting. He's not flexing his chest in front of Timothy going, dude, I'm the man. He's saying, no, here's what I want to tell you at the end of my life. I fought the fight. He stood before Agrippa and Felix and the officials of Rome with courage. He stood up in the midst of the riots in Ephesus and the opposition in Corinth. He went through physical, mental, and spiritual struggles. There's a list in scripture of how many times he was beaten and imprisoned and starving, and he went through all of that. And Paul has no regrets. He said, I fought the fight. And then he says, I finished the race. Uh, It's interesting to me. I didn't notice this, but there's some nuance in the language I'm told that it doesn't say he won the race. He said he finished. Because who won the race? Jesus. Jesus completed the race. Paul said, all I want to do is cross the finish line, having done my life's work to the glory of my God. Paul was a guardian of the gospel. And he's telling us, folks, we're in a fight. Let's not deny it. We can't protect one another. It is hard to be a believer, not just today, but any day, because faith is the opposite story our culture wants to hear. They want to hear evidence and proof and happiness and satisfaction and pleasure. The gospel offers us joy and hope. But in the future, having finished the race, he says, verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Notice he brings the judgment day back into play here. This is where he says to us what he said at the beginning. The reason I'm telling you this is Jesus is coming back. And he's not just coming back angry, although that image in Revelation is pretty awesome. Tattoo on his leg, big sword, white horse, that kind of stuff. Pretty awesome. But when he comes back, he's going to look at us and say words that we want to hear. Well done. You ran the race. You fought the battle. You did well. And there's a reward when he comes. Not just anger and seething and punishment and disappointment. But no, he's going to come and he's going to place a crown on our heads. And that that Greek word for crown is stephanos. It's a crown of achievement. You see, Jesus is going to look at the things we offered him in praise. And he's going to thank us. And he's going to reward us with the crown of stephanos. He's going to place it on our heads. And he's going to say, you were found faithful. If you were And then he wears a diadem. And this is a crown of authority, of deity. And we will never wear a diadem. That's for him to wear. He's the worthy one. We get to wear the crown of achievement. But what's beautiful in the book of Revelation is intimated that we will take our crowns that he's given us, our crown of righteousness, and we will place it at the feet of our king. And that will be the moment that we say, I am what I am because you were what you were. And we will worship him in this beautiful moment of surrendering to the hope. See, one day my buddies and I got together to play wiffle ball. And it was the last time we would ever play and nobody knew it. And one day our lives will stop in the middle, either by death or the return of Jesus. And nobody knows the time or day or hour in which he'll come. Like a thief in the middle of the night, don't be scared. We will kneel before our Savior, amen? But how many of those you love will have to kneel before a judge? It doesn't have to be that way. Our words matter. We are a people who bring hope and life. Paul says, I'm going to finish my life poured out to Jesus, and I fully expect when he returns a glorious day, and he's offering us to join with him. So I'd like to ask you this morning, have you ever trusted Jesus as your Savior? Will you kneel before your Savior today, accepting his life's blood that cleanses you from your sin? Because he will come judging the evil and the good. He will judge the righteous and the unsaved. And he will come back doing that as he promised. We build our lives on that. His first coming proved his love. His second coming proves his truth. 
Or maybe this morning, are you living in the light of that return? Are you just putting it off saying it's going to happen one day, but not today? I don't know that it'll happen today. There's times I want it to happen today. Sometimes I want it to happen later. But we don't control that. We just know that we prepare our hearts. Are your hearts prepared today to share the words of truth that you're building your life on? And can you think of one or two people right now who need to know what you know because you love them? Because you don't want them to, to kneel before a judge. You want them to kneel before your Savior. If we can help you this morning, walk with you, encourage you, strengthen you, there are tables in the back with lamps lit. People are standing back there right now. There's a prayer center in the foyer. We'd love to walk with you as you walk with us. But church, let's take serious. The words of the gospel matter. They've changed our eternity. They can change everybody's. Let's stand together.
high King of heaven, my King forever. Jesus, we stand thankful before you this morning. Thank you for the truth of the gospel. It is our hope, it is our strength, it is our joy, it is our peace, it is the ground that we stand upon. Help us to please remain faithful to you like you have been so faithful to us. Help us to remain in your love and to show it to others. That the goodness of the gospel might be made known. That the light might shine into the darkness. That your kingdom would come here. And your goodness would be experienced. We love you, King Jesus, and we are thankful to be your people. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week.